I think what I really like about art in public spaces is the way that it can like surprise you. Like if you're going to an art gallery or something, you're expecting to see art and it just like affects you in a different way rather than if you turn a corner or you walk into a space and you see something, I feel like it can change your entire mood or your thought process throughout the day. If it's in a place where you wouldn't expect or if it's kind of something that you've walked by over and over and then all of a sudden you, you notice it. I think it's interesting. It can be both. It can be um, eye-catching or it can be just part of the scenery. We were approached by the committee at Stevenson High. They approached us with the QLC, the Quiet Learning Center, the space that they had sort of dedicated to us specifically as artists. They interviewed the students at the beginning of this process um, and asked them what they wanted from this space. They wanted something really subtle, calm. They didn't want to have to overanalyze it because this is somewhere where they're studying already. I think Brandon and I are both really inspired by nature and natural elements and um, figuring out how we can incorporate that into both of our works. So this was fun to, to sit down together and figure out how we can meld our different styles together. I think working with natural materials for me is um, just kind of an extension of what I love to do anyways. I like to kind of preserve the things that I'm worried about losing as the climate changes. So I like that this is sort of a cemented version of what the seasons in the Midwest feel like right now. Shane was like, I really like this look of watercolor, but I'm not sure how we would achieve that with natural materials. Like for me, I, I think of everything in, in 2D form of paint and mediums. So my thought was like, how can we make something look watercolor-ish? When you're painting, sometimes, I don't know if you do this, but you'll step back and kind of blur your eyes and make sure that the composition and the colors and everything are working together. So it was a little bit of like a physical sort of representation of that, right? Where you are creating this composition and the colors that work. And then by overlaying the tinted resin, it like diffuses it all and gives it sort of a watercolor effect. We actually tried not to do resin, but there's really nothing else that does what it does. Um, and the way that you can build up layers and get that like depth, I think is really hard to achieve with other materials. I think, especially with big projects, I tend to want to just go all in, um, like all day, all night until it's completed. And this was a project that the materials wouldn't allow us to do that. It was like an exercise in having our hands off a little bit more than we like to. We weren't able to like manipulate the material as much as we usually can. You can do everything you can think to make it go correctly. And then you have to just pour it and wait 24 hours and just kind of cross your fingers and hope that it turns out right and hardens properly. No project is ever super smooth or perfect. It's just, I think it's part of the artistic process. I actually thought the sanding process was really satisfying. You sand it and you kind of watch all the elements disappear under this like frosted layer. And then when you do the top pour, they all emerge again through that like clear resin lens. It's like a really satisfying, yeah. beautiful process. I think that it, it's the surprises and the unplanned things that make especially things like this really special. And I like to lean into that. With our test panels, one of our tests didn't react the way that we wanted um, and we had to, to figure it out. It was like a totally new process. We were inventing it and every element was unknown. Basically, we were building the molds, we were adding silicone, we were doing a mold release. We were pouring this new material, a chemical process, which was affected by the air changes, the temperature changes in the room. We had to to figure it out. Um, and if we didn't figure it out, then we wouldn't have been able to finish the project. I feel like I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, like, okay, what's the backup plan if this doesn't work? We were doing this in winter and resin has to cure at a temperature between what, 75 and 85. 85. And so we had to keep the room super hot and we're like, well, you know, how perfect does that have to be? It, it turns out be, perfect. <laughs> it's out, yeah, it has to be pretty perfect. I mean, how many times were we on the phone with the, the resin company? You know, we would call them directly with questions like, 
why is it doing this? We were on YouTube, we were looking up other resin artists, like how did, how did they solve these problems? What was their process? There's always a lot of experimentation in the middle and like knowing that you'll figure it out if you just kind of keep pushing through. I think we were surprised by how much the finished product looked like our intention from the beginning. Like we had this idea of creating depth and then actually seeing them was really satisfying. But we were obsessed with looking at the poured panels. Like we'd get up really close. Yeah. Oh, look at how that acorn looks so through rich. the foggy resin. I still think I'm mesmerized by them because there's so much contained in them and the, the depth just makes everything look beautiful. I mean, even though there's, you know, 23 panels and it's huge, we I think we each have favorite areas that are like this big, you know, because it was <laughs> like, oh, that leaf looks so good. <laughs> right, that leaf next to that petal is yeah. so perfect. And <laughs> But that's how we are when we're out walking in the woods. We're right. like, oh, did you see that berry? <laughs> right. I hope that, you know, even if you're in that space day after day, you'll notice something different every time that you look at them.